Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. So I guess the question is, why church or is it relevant today or not relevant and what's been your experience? It should be relevant. I really do believe that. For me at least, uh, church isn't that relevant because I feel that just church in general and church in religion is just encouraging you to be a good person and do good things. It's, it's relevant. I don't think it's like the center of people's lives anymore. It is a hard knock life, isn't it? We experience stuff all the time. That was my crew, by the way, my wife and daughters and I. And we put that together this week just because we're talking about the third reason that we say yes to church. The third reason that you ought to say yes to church, if maybe you're on the fence, is because the truth is life is hard. And I think we all know that. I don't think uh, many of us need to be convinced of that truth Anyway, uh, my name is Matt. I serve at ACC as a lead pastor, and I'm really glad you're here. I'm really thankful that you said yes to church, at least today, because I believe that God has you in this room for a reason, and I'm glad you're here. Uh, I want to uh, try to maybe take a, a pulse on the, the, everyone in the room here for a moment. In my home growing up, uh, I was raised in a Christian home, so we always knew that the Bible was a source of truth, and we... we uh, kind of behaved based on that, and we, we did our best to live a life that was honoring to that truth. But at the same time, we had some like superstitions that we also believed to be true that weren't based on Scripture at all. Anyone else uh, experienced that before? Have you ever heard this one, that it's, uh, it's bad luck to open up an umbrella indoors? Am I, I'm not the only one, right? So we, we understand this uh, to be a superstition that obviously isn't true. There's nothing actually that happens when you open up an umbrella indoors, other than I think our parents just didn't want us opening an umbrella indoors, maybe. Uh, how about this? That it's bad luck to walk under a ladder, right? Or, or it, I bet you all know this one. If you step on a crack, you'll break your mama's... Nobody? Yeah. There we go. All right. So these are the crazy superstitions. My, my mother-in-law has one. Uh, on New Year's Day, there's a couple superstitions. Uh, one, you're supposed to eat black-eyed peas on, on New Year's Day. Did I say Mother's Day before? No, New Year's Day. On New Year's Day, black-eyed peas supposedly bring you good luck for the new year. I didn't, I didn't know that until I married my wife. <clears throat> and supposedly the way you behave on New Year's Day like sets the whole like pace for the rest of your year. So you need to make really good choices on New Year's Day. You're going to mess everything up, right? So these are some crazy superstitions, yet at the same time, Many of us actually find ourselves saying things like, oh, knock on wood, or, you know, I, I kind of acting or believing in some of these things. You know, there is a superstition that Christians believe oftentimes. We don't even realize that we believe it, but it's a superstition that goes like this, that Jesus is like a rabbit's foot, that if you keep him in your pocket, if you keep Jesus close enough, if you have a close enough, good enough relationship with him, then you'll have good luck, and good things will happen to you, and, and when bad things happen, they'll, they'll get fixed right away, because you can just go to Jesus, and he'll take care of everything. It's this idea that Jesus is like this, this rabbit's foot that we keep in our pocket. And maybe you've bought into this myth before. If you've ever thought to yourself, hey, if I'm just a good enough Christian, then everything I pray for should be given to me. Have you ever found yourself frustrated that something you've been praying about hasn't happened? Maybe you've bought into this superstition, right? Or maybe you thought to yourself, am I just a good enough Christian, then, then I won't struggle with depression. Uh, if you believe that, then you've maybe bought into this superstition. Maybe, you know, if, if I'm just a good enough Christian, then I won't struggle with temptation. What? Like, we all know, right? 
But that isn't true. And yet, we find ourselves believing some of these things that if I just, if I trust in Jesus, if I keep Jesus with me, then I'll experience financial blessing and I'll have wealth and abundance and everything I've ever wanted will come to me. And if I, if I just trust Jesus enough, I won't ever get sick. Or if I do get sick, he'll take it away right when I ask him to. And these are things that sometimes we can find ourselves treating Jesus like a, like a, like a, a rabbit's foot, that we just kind of believe that that with Jesus, we won't have any pain, we won't have any sorrow, we won't have any trouble in our life. Everything will go perfectly for us because of Jesus. And I want to, I was going to say encourage you, but I want to share with you what I would call the most discouraging promise in all of Scripture. Now listen, when you open up the Bible, the Bible is filled with incredibly encouraging promises, all sorts of really valuable truth and a source of joy can be found in the the pages of the Bible. But I want to share with you what I would call the most discouraging verse in the Bible. It's John 16, verse 33. And here's the promise. You ready? It says, here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. You don't ever find that one on your little daily encouragement calendar, do you? (laughs) Oh, everything's good. Everything's bad. Well, that, that verse doesn't ever show up in that calendar, right? Because that's not a verse that most of us would find encouraging. We don't like the idea that on this earth we will incur- encounter many trials and sorrows. That's not encouraging for most of us. That's a bad news sort of verse. And if that's not enough, I can keep going. In 1 Peter uh, 4.12, it says this, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Or don't Don't be surprised or shocked when you find yourself in the middle of a financial burden or you lose a loved one or your job is on the line or you lose your job or something, this, whatever. Whatever is happening to you right now in this moment, the Bible says, don't be surprised. Don't think that there's something special about you, that all this is happening to you right now. The truth is that this is a promise that has been made to every single one of us, that we are going to experience trial. We are going to experience trouble in this life. Are we all on the same page? All right, well, go and be blessed. (laughs) No? All right, we'll keep going. That's kind of a bad spot to stop, I think. Um, If you take that John 16, 33 verse, and you uh, look at the last part of it, if you want to pull it up in your Bible, you can see that that verse continues. It says, here on earth... You will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. You see, it's Jesus is the one speaking. Jesus is the one who makes this promise. Essentially what he says is here on this earth, you will experience many trials, but I have overcome this earth. This, this, this place where you're experiencing all the trouble, this, this world in, in which you're encountering all this trial, I have overcome this world. And there's encouragement kind of sandwiched together with this discouragement. And I, now we're kind of left wrestling. How do we take these two things and marry them together? How do we take the truth that you will experience hardship and Jesus is good? How do we take these two things and put them together? And how do we in- involve the church in this process? Why should we p- be part of God's church in the midst of all of that? One verse that many uh, of you may be familiar with, it's Romans 8, verse 28. It says this, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose for them. Right? So the Bible says that, that we know, those of us who have been through enough trial, those of, enough, those of us who have been a part of, of faith for long enough, that God takes those things and uses those circumstances And he kind of weaves them all together. And then when you step back from the tapestry, you see this beautiful thing that God takes all of your experiences, both good and bad, and kind of weaves them all together for one really good thing. That all things work together for good. So we we have this, again, this promise that there's a a, a promise of bad things that are going to happen. Life is hard. It's a hard knock life. And the truth that God is good at the same time and that there's, there's a, some way that he's taking all of these experiences and all the goodness of himself, and he's weaving them together into something really good for you and I. So how do we, what do we do with that information? 
And I think the best way uh, to, to explore that is really understanding two really important truths. One, we need to see hardship, listen to this, as an opportunity. We need to see hardship as an opportunity. And there's really two things we're going to talk about this morning. You're going to see that hardship is an opportunity not only for you, that's the thing we're going to explore first, but it's also an opportunity for the church. So every time God brings kind of, or allows, uh, kind of permits bad things or, or struggles or trials or things that are happening in your life, anytime that something like that is happening, it's very important to understand that those things, according to God's word, we can rewire the way we think and see those things not as bad things, but as good things. We can see them as opportunities that God has given us to walk through. So let's look at this first one, that hardship is an opportunity for you. And here's where we get that from. In James 1, verse 22, it says this, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way. Notice this word right here. Dear brothers and sisters, it doesn't say if troubles come your way, right? What does it say? When. It's a promise again, all right? When troubles of any kind come your way. It's going to happen, all right? So when they come your way, according to this verse, it says consider it an opportunity. If we can change the way we think to see these trials and, and sorrows and, and temptations and, and just the things that are happening in our life, to see these kind of bad things as opportunities for great joy is what the, the Word of God asks us to do. And if you're like me, you see a verse like that and you think probably exactly what I think is, I don't want to, right? I don't want to look at like bad situations, things that are difficult that I don't enjoy going through. I don't want to open my life to those and say, come on, bring it on, right? Those aren't the opportunities I look for. I would rather find opportunities for ease, for kind of prosperity, for things to be going well, for health. All the things we stay focused on, those are the things that we're constantly trying to kind of gather for ourselves. And the Bible says, but, but what if you could change the way you think and see that when you get to a crossroad and you have the ability to choose a life of ease or a, a path that has some hardship on it, and if you knew that this path over here was leading to something incredible, that you would see it as an opportunity. You would see that path as, hey, I have the opportunity to walk kind of this hard road, but it's going to take me somewhere really great. And we have to change the way we think about trial and look at it as an opportunity. And if I were taking this opportunity for you and breaking it down a little further, so we're going to, if those of you are taking notes, I apologize, it's not going to be super clear today. We have point number one, it's an opportunity for you, but there's three ways that it's an opportunity for you. The first one is that it's an opportunity for you to grow. It's an opportunity for you to become a better version of you tomorrow than you are today. That's what that means. In James 1, uh, if you keep reading thir verses 3 to 4, it says, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Right? It's kind of like training for like a marathon. By the way, this is something I've never done. I'm not talking from experience here when it comes to training for a marathon. Uh, but I, I've been told, right, that if you're going to train for a marathon, you go out and you work and you run and you, you kind of work past the pain, right? You've got to run past. You've got to take where you ran yesterday and run a little further. And you've got to keep kind of working at your endurance and your perseverance. And it's going to hurt. But at the end of it all, once you've kind of gone through those really tough situations, you'll be able to get through it. The endurance will be built up in you. You'll have the strength to finally finish. If I went out right now and tried to run a marathon, it would be not good, right? Probably the same for many of us in this room. Then we have 1 Peter 1. Now, Peter takes this idea, and he, he, when I read this, I'm just like, all right, Peter, you're taking it a little too far. You know what I'm talking about when you have a friend who pretends to be excited about something bad, and you're like, nice try, you're trying to trick me into being excited about this with you, right? I feel like that's what Peter's doing here. Here's what he says. He says in 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7, he says, be truly glad when you find yourself in really hard situations. Uh, he even uses the word truly. Here's what he's saying is it's really easy for all of us to come here on a Sunday morning 
and to park the car after we've been fighting the whole time, you know, on the way here, and then to walk into church and have a smile on her face and pretend like everything's fine. We can act like, even though hard things are happening to us, that we have the strength to get through it, and we can pretend that we know that something better is ahead. And at the end of the day, most of us, according to this verse, are probably faking it. Because what Peter says is don't just pretend to be okay with it. Listen to this. Actually rewire the way you think so that you can be truly glad. You can walk into the middle of a trial and say, I'm really glad this is happening to me in this moment. And then Peter goes on and says, there is wonderful joy ahead, even though you must endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. Notice in this verse, it says that your faith is being tested the same way that fire tests gold. Now, I don't uh, have a lot of knowledge about how to take gold and, and put it through the purification process, but here's what I do know, that in order to take gold and to purify it, you have to put it into extreme heat, right? You have to take the gold and turn it into a liquid, and then you run it through some process where you're then able to take the the junk off the top, right, the scum that doesn't, you, know, you kind of scrape that off, and what you have left when you pour it back into bricks, uh, right, is, is purified gold. The truth is, though, that unless you take the gold and you put it into the fire, it's not going to be purified. It's going to be impure. The same is true with a statue, right? If you just take a big block of marble, it's not anything pretty to look at, but if you allow an artist to chisel at it and to break pieces off of it and to kind of take it through a really painful process, at the end of it, you have something beautiful. And the same is true in our lives, that if we allow ourselves to kind of walk through trial, if we see it as an opportunity for growth, it's like we're being refined in fire. It's like we're a statue who's submitting to a chisel. We're allowing the sculptor, God, to work in us and to create something beautiful out of us. We have to be willing to go through that process. So, number one, it's an opportunity for you to grow. It's also an opportunity for you to focus. It's an opportunity for you to focus. Here's one of the things I've, I've learned in life, and you'll probably a- agree to this as well. If everything is going well for you, if you find yourself in a season of blessing, maybe in a season of wealth, you know where uh, there's money in the bank, you know where you're going to work, you, know, you have all your relationships are great, and you just find yourself in a season where there's not anything hard happening to you in that moment. Isn't it amazing how your focus shifts from being so reliant on God and spending time with Him that your focus tends to shift towards the blessings that you've now accrued because of what He's done for you? And you start to focus on the things that the, the blesser has given you instead of the blesser himself. And it one of the things I love about difficulty is that when we're experiencing it in our lives, it kind of forces us to refocus on the only thing that really matters. I want to share with you a quote by an author, Larry Crabb, and he says this, the central obstacle to Jesus's life flowing in us and pouring from us is this, we want something else more, and that's evil. Here's what it is that that Larry's saying most of us want. We want the blessings of a better life more than we desire to draw near to Jesus. Another way of saying that is it's easy to get consumed with what God can do for us instead of God himself. And oftentimes we walk through life like Jesus is a rabbit's foot in our pocket And the only reason we hang on, the only reason that we're kind of connected, the only reason we want this relationship is because of what God can do for us instead of because of God and what he wants to do in us and the relationship he desires to have with us. You see, we take the relationship and we turn it on its most kind of selfish perspective and we we look at what can the blesser give me instead of how can I be a part of loving the blesser. 
In Habakkuk 3, there's a really cool passage that reminds us what focus looks like in the midst of pain. It says, even though the fig trees have, have no blossoms and there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. I want to, when you hear a verse like that, it, I think it begs a question. I want to ask you, and if you are, if you have yet to make a decision to follow Christ, I want to give you permission just to tone, like zone me out for a moment. Those of you who are followers of Christ, this question is for you, okay? If everything were to be taken from you today, the people you love were to be stripped from your life, the house and car maybe you drove here in and the house you slept in last night was to be taken, your bank accounts were to be emptied, your best friend was to walk off, and, and you found yourself left even maybe without your health, and you sat there and you seriously were in a moment where tonight you have nothing. Would Jesus be enough for you in that moment? Would the fact that the, the cattle, you know, barns are empty and there's no flocks in the field and there's no olives on the trees and there's nothing, and you find yourself like this verse said where you are just, you're, you're, you got nothing left except Jesus. Would that be enough for you? See, what happens in these moments of difficulty is things are stripped away as a comfort is stripped away or as a joy or something that you find important is kind of taken from you and you find yourself in the midst of hardship, it helps you to refocus on what really matters, which is Jesus. It's really powerful how many people will only find themselves praying and talking to Jesus in those difficult seasons of their lives. In, um, if you want to explore this a little further this week, I want to, I want to invite you to look at John 6. In John 6, there's a really kind of cool uh, conversation that takes place. And here's what happens. Jesus is talking to his disciples. And right before this happened, uh, Jesus had just fed the, the, the multitudes with the five loaves of bread and the two fish. So Jesus has just taken bread and made it out of nothing and fed thousands of people. All right. And now we're at John 6 where they're sitting down for a feast. And, and Jesus isn't there at first. And then when Jesus comes into the party, they basically say, we're really glad you're here. And here's why they're really glad he's here. Because this is the guy that can take bread, which, by the way, in this day and age, without bread, uh, you know, th that was like their, their meal. This is what people ate. The only time they ate extra special things were on special feasts and festivals and, and different parties weddings and things like that. But for the most part, bread was the thing that sustained life. And they're, they're really happy that Jesus has walked in because this is the guy that just took five loaves of bread and filled everyone to overflowing, right? This is, this is the Jesus that, that man, he, he can do some pretty cool things with bread. And now he enters in and they want, they want some bread. And Jesus says this. He says, I am the bread of life. Essentially what he's saying in that moment is you guys think that bread is the thing that without which you die. I want to tell you something a little bit deeper than that. I, Jesus Christ, am the thing, the thing, the only thing that without which you will die. He kind of turns their way of thinking into saying this. I am enough. And we see this in Habakkuk where essentially... We have this phrase, yet, even though everything is gone, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation. So I want to encourage you in the middle of hardship to focus on the God who is the bread of life for you. And here's a third reason why this is an opportunity for you. Hardship is an opportunity for you specifically to connect to the church, right? And, and uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we learn that the church isn't a building, right? The church is not 710 Aquahart Road. The church is a body of believers. When we gather together, we make up the church. 
And we learn that the church is made up of all sorts of different parts. Every single one of us is different. We're all uniquely gifted. We all have different talents and experiences. And when we come together, we make up this thing called the body of Christ. And when you find yourself in a difficult season, you have an opportunity to, to, to kind of fulfill and, and be loved on by the body that you're connected to. You have an opportunity to connect to the body. So that leads us to our second thing. Not only do you have an opportunity for you in hardship, it's also an opportunity for the church. Point number two, it's an opportunity for the church. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23 says this, but it says, God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. I love that. It says, and the church, that's you and I, are his body. It is made full and complete in, but by Christ who fulfills or who fills all things everywhere with himself. So essentially what this verse is saying is that Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the, the decision maker. Jesus is the one who calls the shots. Jesus is the one who tells the church how to and what to do and what to stay focused on. Aren't you guys glad that Jesus is the head of the church and not some board or some pastor in charge of what is going on here? Jesus is the head, right? And then Jesus, as the head of the church, comes as, the, as to benefit the church so that the church can fulfill the, the role of the church, so that the church can be the hands and feet of Jesus. Here's the crazy thing about, about God. He doesn't need you and I. Listen to this. If you decide, I am not going to participate at all, in God's plan for, for, for eternity, I'm just going to kind of sit on my hands and do nothing. I'm not going to give. I'm not going to serve. I'm not going to connect with anyone. Guess what? God is still going to do what he's going to do without you. He doesn't need you. He doesn't need me. If all of us just decided to quit right now, the church wouldn't die. It would continue to go on because God ultimately doesn't need us. But the truth is this. He chooses. It's kind of plan A for how he interacts with the world that he loves is this invention that he made called the church. He created the church to ultimately be his hands and feet to a broken world. I don't know if you've ever heard of the, uh, the book, it's uh, back in the early 1900s, The Invisible Man. And in this, in this, this storyline, I think they made some movies out of it way back when, the invisible man was just that, he was invisible. And the only way you would know where the invisible man was is if they would take a bucket of paint or something, right, and pour it on him, and then he would be covered in it, and now you would be able to see where the invisible man was. Well, I love uh, the pastor, uh, J.D. Greer, kind of takes that thought and helps us understand the role of the church. And he says this, The love in the local church is the paint that makes the invisible Christ visible to our community. You see, we have the opportunity to be the paint that makes an invisible God visible to the people around us that are hurting and broken. You see, hardship is an opportunity for the church to be the church. That's really cool stuff. So let me show you this in a few different ways. Number one, it's an opportunity for the church to share your burden. When you find yourself in the middle of a hardship, your hardship actually gives the church an opportunity to be the church in your life. One of the best examples of this is with Moses. If you remember, uh, there's a story in Exodus chapter 17 where Moses is uh, standing up on like a hill looking down over a, a battle. And the Israelites and the Amalekites are fighting. And every once in a while, Moses realizes when his hands are up in the air, the Israelites are winning. And when his hands go down, they start losing. So he's standing there with his arms up in the air, and I don't know if you have ever tried to put your hands up in the air for a long period of time. Eventually, it gets very tiresome, right? So we find out what, uh, what Moses' friends do. It says, when Moses' arms grew tired, Aaron and Hur brought a stone for him to sit on. And while they stood beside him, uh, while they stood beside him and held up his arms, holding them steady until the sun went down, in this way, Joshua totally defeated the Amalekites. This is the picture of the church. This is when your friends, your church, the body of Christ comes behind you and says, hey, we see that you're going through this battle. 
And we see that right now it seems like the battle isn't going well, that you're feeling defeated and that things aren't quite going exactly the, the, the best way. We want to come beside you and we want to give you something to sit on. And we want to help you. We want to hold up your arms through this thing. And we want to see that as we kind of power together, as we kind of help each other, as we go through this thing together, as we carry the weight and shoulder the burden with you, that the battle starts turning. It's amazing what happens when the body of Christ does what the body of Christ was meant to do. In Galatians 6, this is one of my, uh, Galatians 6, 3 is I, oh, the second part of this verse. It's got to be one of my favorite verses in the Bible just because of how snarky it is. Anyone have a really snarky personality? You kind of say something every once in a while and you're like, I shouldn't have said that. But here's one of those in the Bible. Uh, Galatians 6, 2 through 3. It says, share each other's burdens in this way and in this way obey the law of Christ. And then it says this. If you think you're too important to help someone, you're only fooling yourself. You are not that important. So here's the truth, church. We were created, at part of God's invention and plan for the church was so that we could carry other people's burdens. And if you think, you know what, I just, I, right now I'm just not in a burden-carrying mood. Or I'm too important to do that. I have other things that are more important to do. The Bible says you're only fooling yourself because you are not that important. You and I are not so important that we are not supposed to be a part of helping other people in their difficulty when they have a burden. We're supposed to pitch in and help. You see, God has given us special gifts. In fact, there's a special kind of gift called a spiritual gift. And the Bible teaches that when you are a follower of Christ, when you make a decision to give your life to Jesus that you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And part of receiving the Holy Spirit living inside of you is uh, you get one or more spiritual gifts. You have these special gifts that only come into your life upon giving your life to Jesus. And these spiritual gifts, sometimes, right, when you, someone gives you something, our natural instinct is to take that thing that we've been given and use it for us. You know, if somebody gives me a car, I'm going to drive the car, me, right? We take what's been given oftentimes and we figure out how can I bless myself with this thing. Well, here's what the Bible says we're supposed to do with our spiritual gifts. In 1 Peter 4.10, it says, God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. And then get this, use them well to serve yourself. It doesn't say that, right? Use them well to serve one another. The reason that we've been given these gifts is so that we can use them not to pour into ourselves, not to kind of make much of our name, but to use them to serve other people around us. That's the point of the church. You see, when someone else has a spiritual gift of mercy or someone else has a spiritual gift of, of helping or of encouraging or love or faith or these gifts, these are gifts that, that they've been given to help you when you find yourself struggling. It's a really powerful truth. Imagine for a moment that, I'm just going to make this overly simple, just for the sake, so, so nobody can miss this. Imagine for a moment me and a friend are out stranded in a desert. And while we're out in this desert, my friend begins to start kind of dying from thirst. He's so thirsty that he just desperately needs a drink or he's going to die. And I'm over here with a canteen filled with ice cold water. And in my, in my canteen is this ice cold water, and on the canteen is a label that says, use this to serve someone else, right? In this situation, all of us are thinking, this is a no-brainer. You take your water and you give it to your friends. That's, you have it. It's not even for you. You're supposed to give it away, and you have a friend over here who needs it. Unfortunately, the, what happens so often is when we find ourselves in trouble, instead of connecting to the church and allowing the church to give us the water, to allow the church to pour uh, what, you know, the, the, what we need into our body, we're, we're just like disconnect and say, no, it's all right. I'm just going to get through this one on my own. Or it's all right. God, I've been praying and God's going to take care of this. You've probably heard the analogy before. Uh, I think it's probably told as a joke, but there's a man and there's a flood and he, the flood is, is rising and he ends up on the roof of his house and he's praying to God. He's saying, God, please send me rescue. And then a neighbor rose up on a little paddle boat, and he says, hey, hey, come on, hop on in. He's like, no, it's all right, I'm good, I've been praying, and God's going to save me. And then uh, a little bit later, now the water's up to the edge of the roof, and the man's, like, feet are getting wet, 
and he, he, he's praying. He's like, God, please save me. And then a Coast Guard boat pulls in, right? And he says, hey, sir, right here, we're here to save you. He's like, no, it's all right. I got, I got it all figured out. God's going to save me. All right? And then later on, the man's like up to his chin, and he's swimming, and he's kind of floundering. And, and a, now a helicopter comes by, and a man puts down a, a, a ladder. And he says, sir, climb up. And he's like, no, it's all right. I'm good. God's going to take care of me. And then later on, he dies, and he's in heaven. He says, God, what was that? I, I prayed for you to save me four times. And God says, right, I sent you a rowboat. I sent you a big boat, and I sent you a helicopter. What, were you, what more were you waiting for? Like, right, we find ourselves going through life on our own instead of allowing the gifts that God has given to the church to be the thing that he's going to use to help us shoulder the burden. In fact, I don't want you to miss this. When you... Don't allow the church to enter into your difficult circumstance. Don't miss this. You rob, you rob them of an opportunity to use their gifts. See the burden, the, or what, what I'm, the, kind of the, the, the weightiness of that, that statement. When you don't allow the church to enter in and to do what the church was meant to do in your life, you rob them of an opportunity to use the gifts that God gave them to help you in that situation. We actually, whenever we have students go on mission trips at this church, uh, let's just say a mission trip costs $1,000. We oftentimes uh, will have families or students say, well, I'll just write a check for $1,000. And we say, nope, you can't do that. You can pay $100 out of your pocket and we want you to send letters out to your friends and family in the church and allow them to come alongside you and love you and to do what they're supposed to do and to support you so they can also be a part of the incredible mission that you're going on. So it's not just this trip that you're going on and it's, just, it's all your money, but no, the church has partnered with you and sent you and released you to go do ministry. See, hardship is an opportunity for the church to share your burden. These next two are real quick. Uh, not only is it a hardship, an opportunity for the church to share your burden, it's also an opportunity for the church, listen, to encourage and cheer you on. Encourage and cheer you on. Let me read three verses. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, it says, So encourage each other and build each other up just as you are already doing. In Romans 15, 7, it says, Therefore, accept each other. So now we have encourage each other, and now we have accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that you will be given glory. In Hebrews 10, 24, it says, let us think of ways to motivate one another, to encourage one another. Some verses of our translation say to spur one another on towards love, acts of love and good works. You see, ultimately what we understand here is there's by the way, those one another verses in the Bible, there's tons of them. They're all over the Bible where we as a church are commanded to encourage and to love and to carry burden and to uh, cheer on and to rejoice with. We're encouraged and, and commanded to be the church in other people's lives while they're going through trouble. All right? It's an opportunity for you, the church, to cheer and encourage others on as they're going through those seasons. And the last one is this. You know, we need to learn to see hardship as an opportunity for the church to rejoice with each other, to rejoice with you. When you're going through something and you find yourself in those seasons of valley, right? As you walk through the valley of the shadow of death in your life and you find yourself struggling, you find yourself burdened, and you find yourself kind of wondering why God's allowing certain things to happen to you, the church has an opportunity in that moment not only to partner with you, and to carry that burden with you, and to cheer you on, and to spur you towards something greater, and to love you through it, but at the very end of it, and even during it, the church has an opportunity to rejoice with you, to champion what is going on in your life, to point out the truth of the growth that's happening in your life, to, to show you that there's joy ahead, just keep moving, but that the church has a, ch a chance and opportunity to rejoice with you. We see in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, if one part of the body of Christ suffers, all of the parts suffer with it. But if one part is honored, all of the parts are glad. 
You see, we have an opportunity to rejoice with one another in those seasons of hardship, and especially as people are kind of coming out of those seasons and into blessing. So as we finish every Sunday, we ask ourselves this question, what now, God? And this is a mini prayer, and I want to ask you right now in your own heart to say this, this three-word prayer. God, what do you want me to do now? What now, God? What do I do with this information? I know that your word is true. I know that you're, you teach me good and valuable things. What should I do with this? And I want to encourage two different types of people in this room. If you're in this room right now, and you are in a season of difficulty... Right now, you are experiencing hardship, you're experiencing loss, you're experiencing pain of some sort. You know exactly what that looks like. If that's you, I want to encourage you with a couple things, a couple decisions you you need to make before you walk out of this room. Number one, I want to ask you to embrace this opportunity to grow in your faith. What I mean by this is I want to ask you to rewire the way you think and to choose right now to be truly glad that that thing is happening to you. Now, that might not make any sense to you. You might think, yeah, I got to go home and I got to pray on that. I got to think through that a little bit. I'm not ready to take the thing that's happening to me right now and to go home and and be glad about it. But I want to ask you, would you be willing to process through the thoughts and the the, the scripture we read today and say, you know what? The decision I'm going to make out of this is I'm going to be truly glad about this thing. Number two, I'm going to focus on my relationship with God and the only thing that really matters. Recommit right now in this moment, God, if this thing keeps happening and if it even gets worse, it doesn't matter because I got you and you're the only thing that really matters in my life. And number three, I want to ask you if you're in the midst of hardship right now to do this special thing. Lean into your church. Allow the church to do what the church was designed to do which is to share the burden with you and to carry the weight with you and to encourage you and to to help you. Don't do it alone. And if you've been praying to God for help and yet disconnecting from the church, the church is part of God's plan to help you through the thing that you've been asking for help with. Allow the church to do what the church does. For those of you who find yourself in a season of ease, those of you who aren't really kind of going through any sort of hardship right now, Hopefully you're wise enough to know it's your day's coming soon, right? We all find ourselves in those seasons. But if right now you find yourself in a season of ease, I want to encourage you to do three things also. Number one, would you be willing to share someone else's burden? A brother or sister who's maybe struggling through something, find someone who needs something that you can help with, that uh, that needs something that you have, and say, you know what, I want to help carry that burden. Let me carry this weight and walk alongside you. I want you to encourage, accept, and spur on your struggling brothers and sisters. And I want to ask you to weep with those who are weeping around you and rejoice with those who rejoice. In other words, just have a little bit of empathy for people who are struggling in a season when maybe you're not. You know what it's like because you've been there. Let's cry together. Let's rejoice together walk with each other through this because, listen, we are the church and that's why God designed us to come together and to connect and walk through this hard knock life together. Let's pray together. Father, I ask right now that you would remind us that you are always good. There's nothing that happens in our lives that you don't know about that happened outside of your control. And even though we don't like sometimes the things that you're allowing to happen, we don't understand why your timing eludes us or for whatever reason we just are confused and angry. I pray right now that you would help us to have the the clarity of thought that you are a good God and everything that happens happens for a reason and that you're using all of it to work together something beautiful, something good that we just can't see right now. I pray that those in this room that are in the middle of trial, God, that they would learn to to enjoy enjoy it and embrace it, that they would see that it's a growth opportunity, that there's something you're working in their life in this this situation. God, help them to lean into your church. And God, for those of us who are in a a season of life where we're able to give more than we take, I pray that you'd help us to give more than we take. Help us to share the burden, carry the weight, rejoice and encourage with one another. 
God, we love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.